uh, reject slavery. Well, I think this is a point that we all have to really realize that the eugenics movement was not uh, invented by the everyday average uh, white American, but by a select group of wealthy white elitists that had often uh, used uh, this ideology to pit all of white America against black America. And so we see that indeed that truly is the case even to this day. Average Negroes possess too little intellect, self-reliance, and self-control to make it possible for them to sustain the burden of any respectable form of civilization without a large measure of external guidance and support. Francis Galton, 1873. Eugenicists believed that Africans were inferior not just mentally but physically and that left to themselves, left alone, they would not make it. The problem is it didn't work. With that failure, the eugenicists moved on to what is known as positive eugenics. In positive eugenics, the eugenicists wanted the white population to reproduce, to have so many children that it overwhelmed the black population. But that didn't work either. Next, they moved on to what they called negative eugenics. They knew that they could not round up all the blacks in the nation and execute them, so they decided to create an environment where they would convince the blacks to severely limit the number of children they were going to have and thereby commit race suicide. The problem of the socially fit must be treated not as one of color, but as a problem of the spread of feeble-mindedness. Dr. Charles Davenport, 1913, director of the Eugenics Record Office, Cold Spring Harbor, New York, and co-founder of the American Eugenics Society. The eugenics realized that they could not uh, promote their agenda simply because they knew it would be viewed as politically incorrect and socially unacceptable. So what they did was use code words that were once successful in slavery, terms such as feeble-minded, uh, unfit, uh, words such as imbecile, immoral, criminal, they uh, tag those labels upon the targeted community. Uh, these words were less inflammatory, so it, it, it lets society more or less not be totally alarmed of the original intent, but deep down inside, I believe everyone truly knew what segment of society and what people they were actually uh, talking about. Even a cursory glance at the charts, photographs, and diagrams used to popularize eugenic ideals reveals that the unfit were swarthy, black, and ugly by Anglo-Saxon standards with flattened noses, wiry hair, and prognathous profiles. Harriet Washington, author, Medical Apartheid. In the early 20th century, the white elitists who made up the eugenics movement were no longer just philosophers and academics. Now they were industrialists and billionaires who had come to embrace a worldview that was essentially identical to the eugenics movement. The same individuals and corporations who had once made millions on the backs of slaves were now willing to spend millions to get rid of them. But that didn't mean that these guys were interested in being public crusaders for the eugenics movement. They were certainly willing to be the brains and the money behind it, but they would hire crusaders to do the dirty work. And the primary one they settled upon was a woman named Margaret Sanger. She was the founder of the American Birth Control League and the publisher of its newsletter, The Birth Control Review. On a practical level, the relationship between Sanger and these elitists was uh, basically a marriage of convenience. In order to advance their common agendas, they needed a front man and she needed money. And the whole thing would be held together by this kind of bizarre obsession with race and class. The result was that the American Birth Control League became the driving force behind the American eugenics movement. Eugenics would no longer just be a philosophy. Sanger and others like her were going to put it into practice. We are paying for and even submitting to the dictates of an ever-increasing, unceasingly spawning class of human beings who never should have been born at all. Margaret Sanger, 1922. 
The laws of nature require the obliteration of the unfit, and human life is valuable only when it is of use to the community or race. Madison Grant, 1916, co-founder, American Eugenics Society. The black man has never been a competitor, but has always been subservient to the white race. And just so long as he remains subservient, his position is secure. And just so soon as he becomes a competitor, his fate is sealed. Dr. Benjamin Hayes, Eugenicist, 1905. The American Birth Control League was wise enough to get their program of population control across by using what had worked in the past, the same code words that had established the institution of slavery and that was also used by the early eugenics movement was once again used by the American Birth Control League. The Margaret Sangers of those days did not come out and say they were trying to eliminate black people. What they did say, they were trying to rid society of the feeble-minded. They were trying to rid the society of the criminal. Well, she was successful simply because of her eugenics friends for the past 50 years had uh, put those labels on minorities and African Americans and therefore society was more or less desensitized. In effect, the code words hid the agenda of Margaret Sanger and the eugenist. At that time, they did uh, shift over to the, what they called the quality of life. Uh, it was a philosophy unquestionably used to target the poor simply because what the quality of life at its core meaning was that poor people really didn't have a reason to live. Only uh, the white, those with status, had any chance of a meaningful or purposeful life. Uh, the solution for the poor now was not to eliminate the circumstances that would cause poverty. Their solution now was to eliminate the poor, eliminate the impoverished, and just wipe them off the face of the earth. The practice of birth control among the majority of colored people would probably be more eugenic than among their white compatriots. The dissemination of the information of birth control should have begun with this class, rather than with the upper social and economic classes of white citizens. Walter Turpening, Birth Control Review, 1932. In virtually every community where Negroes dwell, one finds them in fat times and lean alike contributing a disproportionate number to the roles of the dependents and delinquents. They make excessive demands on the white man's charity and overtax his patients. Newell Sims, Birth Control Review, 1932. Author Madison Grant was a co-founder of the American Eugenics Society and an officer of the New York Zoological Society. In 1906, he had authorized an exhibit at the Bronx Zoo in which a 22-year-old African named Oda Benga was displayed in a cage in the monkey house. Sharing the cage with Benga was an orangutan. When a local clergyman protested the exhibit, he said that it was clearly intended to be a demonstration of Darwin's theory of evolution. Local proponents of Darwinism apparently agreed and labeled the display educational. Ten years after this event, Oda Benga committed suicide. During Hitler's regime, the Germans were supplied with elaborate charts and complicated theses supposedly proving the superiority of the German people. It is interesting to note that at the bottom of these charts were the colored people of the world, most conspicuously, the black people. Floyd McKissick, National Director, Congress of Racial Equality, 1967. An often overlooked fact.